In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Christ is risen. I wanted to speak today a little bit about the continuity of the Gospels that we hear and some of the lines that transform or transcend, I should say, and move from one Gospel reading to the other. And these three Gospel readings that I want to tie in today, one of them we just heard, which is the healing of the blind man. The other Gospel reading is the reading we heard last week of the healing of the paralytic. And then the other reading that I wanted to tie in is several weeks ago when we heard about Lazarus being raised from the dead. Now what is the, what is the common thread in, in these gospel readings? Well last week we heard about the paralytic who was laying there. Christ sees him, tells him to take up his pallet and go home. And he, he heals him on the Sabbath, which was the day nothing was supposed to be done. Very similar to today's gospel reading where he heals the blind man on the Sabbath. Another similarity is he found this paralytic man that we heard of last week, and he also found the blind man in today's gospel. But one of the interesting things of last week's gospel was at the end of the gospel, after he heals him, he tells the man, he finds him again in the temple, and he says, see that you sin no more so that nothing worse befalls you. In other words, don't sin because if you sin, something worse, worse is going to happen. And I spoke about that last week. So we start the gospel reading today and we hear the disciples ask him a question that picks up from the last miracle. So Christ addresses the, the paralytic last week and says, don't sin because something worse will happen to you. And then this gospel reading starts out with the disciples seeing the blind man and they said, who sinned? They asked Christ, who sinned, this man or his parents? Now, it goes back from the time of the Old Testament where the sins of the parents could go generations after um, as, as a destructive uh, presence in the life of, of, the, of the children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren. And we see that, and I've spoken about that before, how the choices of family members can impact future family members, too from abuses to uh, all different kinds of things can pass on from generation to generation. The opportunities, the faith that we have can either be lost or it can be moved on through the generations. But that's not what I want to talk about specifically. I want to talk about the, the apostles saying to Christ, who sinned, this man or his parents? In other words, he's blind because you mentioned last week, now the disciples are thinking, you mentioned last week, Christ, that something worse would befall the, the person. This man, in today's gospel reading, the fathers of the church, St. Basil um, and St. John Chrysostom, uh, St. Athanasius even writes about this particular reading. But the fathers of the church say this man wasn't just blind, he had no eyes, no eyeballs, nothing. It was just sockets. So his eyes were closed and they were missing. His eyes were completely missing. That's why we hear later in the gospel, is that really him? Is it not him? We couldn't tell because without your eyes, it's very difficult to know a person. In fact, they've, they've done studies um, we, even with eyebrows and eye features and they move them around and you can't identify a person uh, if you've ever seen that online. But the point of, of this is the disciples are saying to him, who in his family did such an atrocity that this man was born with no eyes. And Christ doesn't address that as the sins of the forefathers. Uh, the fathers of the church write about it and they say that the, the sins that passed down, it's not in this particular story. It's not the generations of sinfulness. It's just the brokenness of humanity. Why do people, uh, why are some people born with physical disabilities or, or physical extraordinary capabilities. It's, it's just kind of the way things are. But the brokenness of humanity is directly a result of the fall of, of humanity. So this man was born with no eyes, Christ says, so that the glory of God might be manifest in him. And not to say that this man was deliberately blinded from birth so that Christ would make him see, but he says, don't focus on that. Focus on what's going to happen. And why is the focus on what's going to happen so important? Because no one in the history of the world, even in the Old Testament miracles, no one 
had been cured from blindness from birth. Now you might say, well, no one was raised from the dead either, right? Christ raised Lazarus from the dead. But if you look back in the Old Testament carefully, Eliseus and prophet Elias raised someone from the dead. So that wasn't necessarily the first time, but this was the first time. This was the first time someone without eyes had eyes and was able to see. And we see this continuity from the, the disciples saying, who did this sin? Why did this happen to him? And then Christ says, no, it's so that the glory of God can be made manifest. And then we see in the story of Lazarus that when Christ stayed back a couple days and let Lazarus die, there was a, there was a couple things that, that, um, that Christ mentions. He says, you know, Lazarus is sleeping. And they're like, oh yeah, he's sleeping, he'll wake up. And he says, no, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there so that you can see the, the glory of God. So he tells the disciples again, a second time, you, you're going to see something extraordinary. And you're going to see it because that is the power and the glory of God. But one of the comments that came that I want you to think about in that story of Lazarus was the fact that when he showed up, and they're all crying and they're saying, Lazarus died. And they said in the crowd, this man, they're talking about Christ, this man who opened the eyes of a blind man, couldn't he have saved Lazarus? In other words, that story of today's miracle was renowned throughout the whole area. Everyone knew what Christ did as something that had never been done. And it was mentioned as this extraordinary thing that happened, this extraordinary miracle, and they even mentioned it at the tomb of Lazarus, saying, he did that. No one's done that. Why couldn't he save Lazarus? Why couldn't he do that? And then Christ, listening to all these comments and all the weeping and the crying and, and Martha and Mary saying, if you had only been here, you could have helped us. And he's your friend and we love you. And you can just, I mean, we, we only get certain lines in the gospel. But it wasn't like they spoke like robots in the gospel. They're just one line and that was it. But I mean, you can envision Christ standing there at the tomb and it says, Jesus wept. It's two words. The shortest sentence in the entire of, entirety of scripture. But was it a short encounter? Did Jesus go, hmm, and then just raise Lazarus? Or was he speaking and, and, and thinking and, and uh, feeling and just standing there where everything stood still waiting for what is he going to do? And then he says, roll away the stone. And they're like, wait a second. He's been dead for four days. It's going to smell. And he says, didn't I tell you about the glory of God if you believe? If you believe. And that's what he is trying to say in today's gospel to his disciples. The glory of God overcomes everything. But the continuity of these stories that we hear year after year, it's important to draw the, the lines between them to put them all together. Because sometimes it seems fragmented, like Jesus did this, and then he did this, and he did this, and there's no bridge between the stories. But we see in today's gospel, these, I mean, there's, there's many other bridges and connections, but we see these two connections between the paralytic and between the story of Lazarus. Also in the epistle reading today, we hear about something that happened more than once in, in scripture and at the time of the disciples when they became apostles. We hear about St. Peter, uh, St. Silas, and St. Paul, all in two different stories, uh, being released from prison. We all know and we've all heard about the, the chains of St. Peter, um, that were released from him. But we hear today in, this, in the, the reading, in the epistle reading, about Silas and Paul. And they're also incarcerated. They're whipped and they're, they're beat and they're placed in prison. And then there's an earthquake. Everything opens up. And then you can see this guard and all the doors are open. And he realizes he's a dead man because everyone have, would have escaped. And then he says, uh, St. Paul says to him, we're still here. And then the man comes and, and converts and changes his way of life. He's baptized. He takes them out. And then in St. Peter's case, when he's released from prison, the guard is sleeping. And you can kind of see it, it always 
it always makes me smile when you think of the, the angel coming into the prison, St. Peter's sleeping, and he just slaps him and says, put your robe on, we're going. And he, gets, he thought it was a dream. And then he, he walks right past the sleeping guard, and he's out, and he walks out. So we hear, again, this same type of story. In other words, God works the same way. There's nothing different in, in the way he decides things are going to happen. If he wants you out of prison, he's going to get you out of prison. He's shown that. If he wants to show you the glory of God, he will show you the glory of God, as he showed the disciples and generations and thousands of years afterwards, how we see the miraculous nature in, in, in life around us and the many miracles that happen to so many around us as the glory of God. So what am I telling you today? Why am I bringing all these things up? Is to remind you that God that you read about, the Christ that you read about, the things that he did, he will continue to do to us. He will continue to be the loving, tolerant, merciful, healing, teaching, embracing God that we understand him to be. So there's nothing different. And we hear, when we say Christ is in our midst, we say he was, he is, and always shall be. In esti esta, as they say in Greek. Kein kesti kesta, which is he was, is, and always shall be. In other words, he's the same. And he will continue to be the same for us. So what do we have to do? We have to take the examples of the saints, the models of of the apostles and apply them to ourselves so that we can fall into the right way of life in order to receive these great and abundant graces from God. So God is the same forever. And I wanted you to at least see that he does things the same way. It's not going to be a surprise that God is going to do something different for you and create some new way. And sometimes people say, well, I'm waiting for some new way that God is, he's going to do it the way he's done it for centuries and for forever, the way God has always functioned. So reach out to him, use the examples in the church, the, the beautiful examples that adorn our walls to model your life in order to receive the grace of God. Amen.